Do you remember the moment when you really understood what death was and then realized that it was going to happen to you? I do. I remember that exact moment, and it was when I was five years old. Yet, to this day, whenever I recall that moment, I feel shudders of the terror all over again. Well, apparently, thank goodness, this is a very common phenomenon amongst us frail humans. Um, and tonight's program is intended to help us understand it and the consequences. In 1973, in his Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Denial of Death, Ernest Becker argued that the awareness of our mortality creates a profound but subconscious anxiety in humans and that in an effort to quell that anxiety, we spend most of our lives trying to explain, forestall, or avoid the inevitability of our own death. In the mid-1980s, three social psychologists and best friends took the ideas further, formulating what they call terror management theory, or TMT. Sheldon Solomon, our special guest tonight, was one of those three psychologists. Sheldon and his colleagues have spent the last 30 years doing experiments to quantify just how much the fear of death actually impacts our actions. So here to introduce us to TMT and lead us to the worm at the core is Dr. Sheldon Solomon. Please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Um, th thank you so much. I can't see you all, which is probably for the better. Um, uh, uh, folks in the back there in coach, everybody here okay? All right, uh, thank you. It's really great to be here. I, I sort of wish I could see you, but this will work fine. Um, this is a tremendous venue, and I'm honored to have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the work that I do uh, that we described in a book that we wrote recently called The Worm at the Core uh, on the Role of Death in Life. And um, in that book, we kind of ruminate about the fact that uh, throughout human history, in fact, all the way back to day one, one, uh, theologians, philosophers, just like people sitting on a rock uh, in the middle of nowhere, ha have been trying to characterize the essence of what it means uh, to be a human being. A and there's been a lot of designations, and I'm sure you're familiar with at least one of them. Uh, who's heard of the, the people being referred to as homo sapiens? Again, I can't see you, but I'm going to assume uh, that most of you uh, are familiar with that notion. It comes from the ancient Greeks, this idea that we're fundamentally rational uh, animals, even to the point of being on occasion wise animals. A and we don't have time to debate the merits of that designation of the human animal. I, I simply mention that to point out that that's one way uh, that people have been characterized uh, over the centuries. Uh, another designation of human beings is Homo ludens. Uh, in the early 20th century, uh, an anthropologist said, oh, we're fundamentally playful creatures. A uh, couple of decades after that, there was another Homo, Homo faber, uh, this idea that we're tool-making, manufacturing creatures. A couple of decades after that, Homo aestheticus, the idea uh, that we're aesthetic creatures, that we're concerned uh, with surrounding ourselves with beauty. Uh, recently, there's been another Homo tossed onto the table, Homo narratization. Uh, somebody has described us as storytelling creatures. And I think those are all pretty good. I think they are useful heuristic devices that draw our attention uh, to different aspects of our humanity that are certainly worthy of our collective cogitation. But what we do in our book is to propose uh, yet another designation. We call it Homo Mortalis. And we thought about that after I ran into a short story by a Scottish uh, writer, Alexander Smith, in the 1850s. And he had a little sentence that I found quite arresting. He said, it is the knowledge 
that we have to die that makes us human. And I thought that pretty much captures what it is that uh, I would like to talk about tonight. A couple of decades later, William James conveyed the same idea in biblical terms when he said that death is the worm at the core of the human experience. And of course, James is referring here uh, to the story of Adam and Eve and back in the day uh, in the Garden of Eden when Eve chomps on the apple from the tree of knowledge and that renders us aware of our mortality and things have declined pretty precipitously thereafter. <laughs> and, um, and then, as Lisa mentioned, 1973, the cultural anthropologist Ernest Becker uh, wins a Pulitzer Prize for his book, The Denial of Death, uh, in which he takes that basic idea that it is our knowledge that we have to die uh, that makes us human and he elaborates upon it from an evolution, uh, evolutionary, existential, psychodynamic perspective. Uh, and that's what I'd like to tell you about this evening, as well as the research that we've done that we think provides a substantial body of evidence that corroborates uh, his basic claims. And so, uh, with that in mind, let's just start uh, from an evolutionary perspective. And I really do wish that I could see you to get a couple of head shakes, but uh, I'm going to assume that uh, you've all heard of Charles Darwin, a couple of head shakes even in the front. <laughs> and I'm also going to assume uh, that you're okay. Uh, with the relatively non-controversial Darwinian assumption uh, that human beings share with all forms of life a basic biological predisposition towards survival uh, in the service of self-preservation as well as reproduction. To put it another way more simply, living things like to stay alive. And for the scholarly types out there, that's from the second chapter of The Origin of the Species that Darwin titled The Struggle for Survival. But Darwin turned right around and he said, yes, uh, like all living things, human beings want to stay alive. Uh, but we're uniquely different, Darwin observed, by virtue of our rather large forebrain uh, that gives us the capacity to think abstractly and symbolically to the point where humans, and only humans as far as we can tell, uh, have the sublime ability to imagine things that do not yet exist and then the audacity to take our dreams and to render them real. Um, question, because I'm doing too much work already. Who was doodling pictures of helicopters in his notebooks in the 1500s? Jump in, anybody. Good, My, uh, Da Vinci actually. Michelangelo had some good doodlings though uh, also. And what do people say uh, when they saw drawings of helicopters in the 1500s? Good, you're crazy, and yet isn't it amazing that today we are routinely transported by what was originally denounced as the doodlings of a madman. I, I like how one of Freud's disciples, Otto Ronck, put it uh, when he said, only human beings make the unreal real. And I hope we can all agree that uh, this is a pretty good explanation of why people have been so prolific and successful uh, as a form of life. All right, let's hold that idea. And let's go back in time a couple of decades. Darwin is 1860s, Masermenos a couple of years. Let's go back to the 1840s and think a little bit about the Danish existential philosopher Soren Kierkegaard. Again, if I could see you, I'd ask who's ever heard of Kierkegaard. And if anyone has ever tried to read him, he's very, very difficult, uh, even in translation. But Kierkegaard in the 1840s, and this is before psychology even existed, uh, he made some strikingly profound observations about people. And what he said is, we are so smart that we actually come to realize that we exist. In psychology today, they call that consciousness or self-awareness. And if I could see you, I would ask you another question, and it's not a trick one, and that's who's aware of the fact that you're sitting here now listening to me or, or pretending to do so? And I would hope that uh, I could get a pretty decent response rate. It's Skidmore 50% and I'm having a good day. <laughs> <laughs> and I know there's some of my former pilgrims out there, so you know what I'm talking about. But, uh, but for the most part, most of us uh, can readily admit that we're, we're not only here, but we know, we know that we're here. And Kierkegaard even takes that further. You ever wake up in the morning and you're walking to work and you're like, here I am 
walking to work, thinking about walking to work. Anybody ever have that kind of experience? How about this? Here I am walking to work, thinking that I'm walking to work while I think about that I'm walking to work. Uh, and Kierkegaard's point, and, and here is the point, uh, is that it takes a ridiculously sophisticated cognitive apparatus to, in his turgid language, render yourself the object of your own subjective inquiry. And the point that Kierkegaard made is that humans are the only ones who could do that. A rose bush exists, but doesn't necessarily know it. An armadillo exists, but doesn't know that it exists. Not going to argue with you about whether or not your dog knows that it exists. All I need you to do is to admit uh, that you're here and you know it. And if you'll grant me those two uh, theoretical assertions, living things like to stay alive, and people are so smart that we know that we're here, all right, then we can keep going. And what Kierkegaard did uh, in a very tiny little volume, it's called Fear and Trembling, and I always recommend that my friends buy it for their in-laws coffee table. It's really a good uh, conversation maker. All right, so Kierkegaard says, well, if you're smart enough to know that you're here, you will necessarily experience two uniquely human emotions that Kierkegaard called awe and dread, respectively. And I like those words because we know what they mean. Awe is awesome. And the point that Kierkegaard made, and I want to dwell on this for at least 30 seconds before things take a decidedly negative turn, <laughs> uh, but the point that Kierkegaard made is that it, it is remarkably uplifting to be alive and to know that we're alive. And that some of our very finest moments are the result of the spontaneous exuberance that we experience just from the fact that we're here. Who's ever had one of those magical days? You ever wake up one day and, and nothing really happened. You didn't win a Nobel Prize. You didn't win Powerball. The Patriots didn't win the Super Bowl. Uh, you just wake up and you're like, yeah, life is great. Uh, who's ever read James Joyce's Ulysses or pretended to have done so? Any, any uh, literary people? Last sentence of Ulysses, 50 pages, the longest sentence in the history uh, of literature. No cap capital letters, no punctuation. That didn't work for me in English class, but I think he won a Nobel Prize from that. But the sentence starts and it ends with the same word. Yes, it is great to be alive. Remember that, uh, because Kierkegaard then turns right around and he says, yeah, but it's dreadful because if you are smart enough to know that you're here, uh, you're also smart enough to know that, like all living things, your life is of finite duration. And, and I hope I'm not the first one to uh, <laughs> bring up this fact to you. Uh, like all living things, you too will someday die. And Kierkegaard's point is that this is not a welcome realization. Uh, a lot of us keep lists of things to do. Walk the dog, pay the cell phone bill, put gas in the car, die. No, most of us don't have that uh, on our to-do list because it would be something that we would readily put off, uh, often in perpetuity, if we can get away with it. But Kierkegaard also pointed out that it's not only the fact that you will someday die and that I will someday die, uh, that is psychologically discombobulating. The discomfort associated with the awareness of death is magnified by the coincident recognition that not only will we die, but we can die at any moment for reasons that we could never anticipate or control. And then just to kind of knee us in the psychological groin, what Becker does is to add a Freudian idea uh, which is that we're animals, and we really don't like to admit of that fact. Who's seen the Elephant Man film? Again, I can't see you. Has anybody seen that film? One of the great films. Remember when the Elephant Man says, I am not an animal? Who remembers that? It's like a great line in the film. And I'm like sitting there, I'm like, I am with you, Mr. Pachyderm. However, uh, you're wrong. Uh, you are an animal, and I'm an animal, and all of you, like it or not, are breathing pieces of defecating meat that from a purely biological <laughs> perspective uh, are no more significant or enduring than lizards or potatoes. And the point that Becker makes uh, is that if that was the only thing that we thought about, I'm gonna die someday. I could walk outside and get hit by a comet. I'm a breathing piece of meat. I'm a cold cut with an attitude. I'm 
I got some better ones. I'm spam with a plan, but I've got no can. Uh, stop me. I grew up in New Jersey. Uh, I'm a, I'm a talking sausage, I'm a pate with panache. You get the point. Uh, if, if that's all that we thought about, we wouldn't be able to get up in the morning. We, we would literally be twitching blobs of biological protoplasm, cowering under our chairs, uh, groping for rather large sedatives. And, and the point that Becker makes is that uh, in order to uh, somehow minimize the potentially paralyzing terror that is engendered by the uniquely human awareness of death, which was an unintended consequence of our vast intelligence, human beings rather ingeniously, although most likely quite unconsciously, uh, d developed uh, what the anthropologists call culture. They used the same symbolic and abstract cognitive capabilities that created this problem in the first place to try to extricate ourselves from it. And what Becker says is that culture consists of humanly constructed beliefs about the nature of reality that we share with our fellow human beings in order to reduce death anxiety by giving us each a sense that we are valuable individuals in a meaningful universe. And in another book of Becker's that I like a lot called The Birth and Death of Meaning, uh, Becker introduces two terms that I like because they're rather straightforward. He calls them meaning and value. And so he says, well, uh, in order to just get up and function every day, we need to think that life is meaningful. And the way that culture allows us to do that uh, is by, first of all, giving us each an explanation of the origin of the universe. All cultures, as far as we know, uh, tell us where we come from. All cultures, as far as we know, uh, give us some prescriptions for how we're supposed to behave while we're here. All cultures, as far as we know, give us some hope of immortality, either literally through the heavens, the afterlives, the souls, the reincarnations of all of the world's great religions, or, or symbolically, as the Greek philosophers, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates noted, well, we may know that we're not gonna be here forever, but we're comforted nevertheless by the prospect that some vestige of our existence will persist over time, perhaps by having children, perhaps by amassing great fortunes and writing our name all over buildings and airplanes, perhaps by producing great works of art and great works of science. But the, the point that he makes is that oh, we need to believe that life is meaningful. And even if you're not a psychologist, if you wake up one day and you're not so sure that life is meaningful, what psychological condition almost invariably results? The most common. Good, depression, very nice. And so depression is when we become disillusioned. We have a hard time finding that life is meaningful. And when we become disillusioned, that renders us demoralized. We no longer have a confident blueprint that enables us to get up and act on a day-to-day -day basis. All right, so uh, meaning is absolutely necessary but not sufficient for psychological equanimity because in addition to that, we need to feel like each of us as individuals is a valuable contributor to the meaningful cosmological drama to which we subscribe. All right, be honest with me, who when you were a little kid ever thought of doing something great? Anybody ever dream of winning an Olympic gold medal? Anybody ever dream uh, of winning a Nobel Prize? Anybody ever like me dream of winning a gold medal and a Nobel Prize? <laughs> and managing a hedge fund at the same time. Well, the, the point that Becker makes is that that's not pathological narcissism. That is just the normal yearning of a self-conscious individual to wanna believe that we're here for a particular purpose. And culture helps us feel valuable uh, by providing us with social roles, with associated standards of conduct, that if we meet or exceed them, it gives us the sense that we're persons of value in a world of meaning. So if you are a hedge fund manager, well, your job is to make money. If you're a nurse, your job 
is to save lives. Uh, if you're the goalie on the Bruins, your job is to keep the puck from getting into the net, and so on and so forth. Well, those are basically Ernest Becker's ideas. Human beings are so smart that we realize that we exist. That makes us aware of death, tragedy, and our animal nature. That creates potentially overwhelming existential terror that we manage uh, by embedding ourselves in a culturally constructed belief system that gives us a sense that uh, we're persons of value in a world of meaning. Head shakes if I'm making sense so far. Is that okay? All right, time out, hang on. Vodka, very good. Okay, so two questions. One question is, well, so what? And the other question is, um, is any of this true? Uh, and I think these are important questions. Uh, and so some of you may be sitting here saying, well, all right, you know, I, I get it. I, this sounds okay, uh, but so what? Uh, and in, in my world, I'm an experimental social psychologist by trade. And, and when, when we ask the so what question, uh, what we really mean is what kind of conceptual or explanatory power do we get from this particular set of ideas? To, to put that another way, it's like, well, uh, what can we understand if we accept these ideas that would be difficult or impossible to understand otherwise? So that's the kind of so what question. And, and then there's the question of, well, how do we know if any of this is true? Now, Ernest Becker won a Pulitzer Prize for his book, The Denial of Death, uh, but uh, he was roundly denounced in academic circles. People just said, you know, uh, this is like poetry. It's just philosophical speculation. Uh, it's interesting, uh, but it's really futile because there's just no evidence for this. And moreover, uh, there's no way that you could provide evidence for this. And this is where Tom and Jeff and I come in. We were young punks right out of graduate school. We discovered Becker's ideas. Uh, we were all excited about them. And we started traveling all over North America and Europe. And I would give talks like this. I think I was wearing the same shirt um, <laughs> in 1983. Uh, and I would be at these academic conferences and all the famous psychologists would be in the audience. And I would be saying the same thing, blah, 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 Kierkegaard, and like 30 people would get up and run out the back, and then I would be like death, and another 50 people uh, would run out the back, and, um, I'd, and I'd be like, uh, Tom and Jeff were like, oh, I don't, I don't think they like it, and I was like, no, no, they love it. Uh, <laughs> They, they were just running to get an advanced copy of the paper that we've not yet written about these ideas. And so uh, that's what we did. We, we wrote a paper, we sent it to our flagship journal, The American Psychologist, and six months later, uh, we get a rejection, and it was one sentence. So, uh, usually you get like 10 single-spaced Russian novel-length pages, <laughs> but we got one sentence. The reviewer said, I have no doubt that these ideas are of no interest whatsoever to any psychologist, alive or dead. <laughs> and, um, and, and so anyway, Jeff and, uh, uh, Jeff and Tom said, I don't, I don't think they like it. Um, <laughs> And I said, no, they fucking love it. Um, they're just being coy. They, they really, <laughs> they, they really, they, they really like it. Um, no, but evidently they, they didn't like it because the, the same paper um, was rejected at every journal in the English speaking world, including Parade Magazine and Be Better Homes and Gardens. And, uh, finally, um, at a psychology convention, standing next to the president of the American Psychological Association, who's also the editor of the American Psychologist. And I had one too many of those ethanol-infused beverages with the little umbrellas in it. And I was like, dude, um, you, you should publish our paper. And he's like, yo, uh, you guys are experimental social psychologists. You should produce some evidence uh, in support of your ideas. And I was like, wow, I, I never really thought about that. Um, it just 
Never occurred to me. Uh, I, I got a PhD, unscathed by knowledge, uh, uh, a method in search of a question, and now all of a sudden we, we really had something uh, that could occupy our attention. So that's what Jeff and Tom and I uh, have been doing for almost 35 years. And so what I'd like to do is to address the so what question uh, and the how do we know this is true question uh, at the same time. And the way I'd like to do that is to just talk about some areas of inquiry, uh, just some things about people uh, that I think we can't understand without recourse to these ideas. And, and then when I do that, I'll also give you a sense of how we've done our studies to determine why I think these ideas are, quote, true. Right, let's start uh, with what was Tom and Jeff's and my original interest, and that is how come people can't get along with other human beings who don't share their beliefs about the nature of reality. Uh, and this bothered us when we were graduate students. Why is it that we can't get along with other people who worship different gods, salute different flags, wear different clothes, sing different songs? And, and as many of you probably know, this problem is not uh, of recent origin. Even the most benevolent glance uh, at human history uh, reveals an ongoing succession of genocidal atrocities juxtaposed with the brutal subjugation of designated in-house inferiors. And the, the question is, well, well why? And uh, what Ernest Becker does in The Denial of Death and in another book called Escape from Evil is to offer, I think, a very provocative answer. And it goes as follows. He just says, well, okay, if our beliefs about the nature of reality serve to minimize death anxiety, then whenever we encounter people who do not share our beliefs, whether we're aware of it or not, we have a problem. Because if we accept the validity of an alternative conception of reality, we necessarily do so by undermining the confidence with which we subscribe to our own beliefs. And once that happens, we expose ourselves to the very anxiety that our beliefs were erected to diminish in the first place. Again, I would annoy you if I could see you and ask if that made sense. That's as close as we get to technical tonight, and so I'm gonna risk putting you in a coma by saying it again. So the point is, is that if your beliefs about reality reduce death anxiety, and you run into somebody who's different, well, that's a problem. Because if you grant the possibility that they're right, well, then you may be wrong. And once you lose faith in your own beliefs, at least as Becker and as we see it, you're gonna experience, even if you're not aware of it, the anxiety uh, that your own death arouses in you. All right, so if I believe that God created the earth in six days before taking a well-deserved break, and then I run into somebody uh, in, uh, in the Borneo of the South Pacific, and I learned that according to their cosmology, the earth was gestated out of a coconut tree, or a giant coconut that came out of the side of a palm tree. Uh, well, if they're right, I must be wrong. All right, so what do we do when we run into people who have different beliefs? Well, the first thing that we do is to denigrate or belittle the possessors of those beliefs. All right, God created the earth in six days. Uh, those other people believe that the earth was created out of a giant coconut. Yeah, but then again, those poor bastards are living in tents, wearing grass skirts, worshiping piles of sticks and mud. They don't have cell phones or CNN. Uh, and of course, if they did, I hope you understand I'm being facetious here, uh, they would surely agree with us. But there's an important point here, and that is that when we denigrate as not quite human, people who don't share our beliefs, that diminishes the threat that those beliefs pose to us. A couple of yays, if that makes sense. All right, while we do that, uh, at the same time, we try to convince people who are different uh, to dispose of their ridiculous beliefs and, and to adopt ours instead. Christian missionaries are very good at that, uh, but they're not the only proselytizers on the planet. If that doesn't work, just kill those bastards, thus proving uh, that your ideas and your God are superior after all. My God is better than your God, and we will kick your ass to prove it. All right, well, 
if we believe Ernest Becker, uh, then uh, what he argues is that we cannot understand man's inhumanity to man uh, unless we're willing to consider uh, that a good deal of prejudice and hostility towards people who are different comes from our inability to accept people who do not share our death-denying delusions. Right? Well, is this true? How do we know if this is true? Right, so what Jeff and Tom and I did uh, was we had an accident. We were sitting around one day bowling and a thought struck us. It doesn't happen often, but it was a good one. We said, all right, uh, here's what we're going to do. Uh, if, the, if Becker is right, then what would happen if we got some people and if we reminded some of those people about their own mortality? And then let's get another group of people and we're not going to remind them of their mortality. We'll remind them of something unpleasant uh, but not fatal, maybe like failing an exam or being in a car accident and having a limb amputated, or giving a talk in such a distinguished crowd and getting sick and projectile vomiting on the first row, uh, and thus feeling ostracized and humiliated. All negative things, uh, but, but, but not fatal. Uh, and so what we thought is that, well, if we remind people of their mortality, that should make them, psychologically speaking, need their culturally constructed beliefs even more. And we should be able to detect that by measuring their attitudes and their behavior to other individuals who either share their beliefs or who are opposed to them or merely different from them. And so we've done literally hundreds of experiments. Sometimes we remind people of their mortality uh, by bringing them into the lab. And we just ask them uh, to scribble down uh, their thoughts and feelings associated with their own death. Sometimes we ask them to fill out a death anxiety scale. Sometimes we show them gory images of like car accidents and autopsies. Sometimes we do the work outside the lab. We stop people and we interview them either in front of a funeral parlor or 100 meters to either side. Sometimes we're really, really subtle. Uh, we bring them into the lab and we have them read stuff on a computer. Uh, but what we don't tell them is while they're reading that stuff, we're flashing the word death so fast, 28 milliseconds, that you can't even see that you have been exposed to it. And my point is that all of the studies that I'm about to talk about, doesn't matter how you remind people of their mortality, it produces the same outcome. All right, so let me tell you about the first study, almost the first study that we did. It was at the University of Arizona, and we had Christian participants at that we randomly divided into two groups. We reminded some of, their, of them about their mortality, reminded others about something unpleasant, and then we asked them to evaluate other students who were very, very similar, except some of them reported that they came from Christian families and some reported that they came from Jewish families. And what we found was quite striking in the control condition uh, and momentarily restoring my faith in humanity, our Christian participants didn't discriminate. They rated the Jewish and the Christian targets uh, equally highly. Right? However, when they were reminded of their mortality first, they liked fellow Christians a lot more, and they hated Jewish people. All right Now, it's important to note that this has nothing to do with Christianity per se. Uh, to be silly, the five Jewish people in Arizona were busy that day, so we, we only used uh, Christians. But if you go over to Israel and you have Jewish people and you remind them of their mortality, uh, they like Jewish people more and they hate Christians. If you go to India, uh, and you remind Indians of their mortality. They love Indians and they hate Pakistanis. Not only do these death reminders radically influence our attitudes, they also influence our behaviors. So Germans reminded of their mortality sit closer to fellow Germans and they sit further away from people who appear to look like Turkish immigrants. Uh, we did a study in Iran uh, where we had Iranians and we reminded them of their mortality. Uh, and we asked them if they supported suicide bombing. And we also asked them if they wanted to become a suicide bomber. And what we found was astonishing. Iranians in a control condition 
Uh, they were not big fans of suicide bombing, and they certainly didn't want to become a suicide bomber. But after they were reminded of their mortality, they were very supportive of suicide bombing and, and quite willing to consider becoming one. I don't know about you, but I find that discombobulating. Uh, at the same time that we did that study, we did another one in the United States. Americans are very pragmatic. We're not about to blow ourselves up, but as you know, we're very happy to blow up other people. Uh, and uh, we reminded Americans of their mortality. Uh, and what we found is that after being reminded of death, Americans were more supportive uh, of the preemptive use of nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons against countries who pose no direct threat to us. And I like George Bernard Shaw. I don't know if any of you know his plays. And he's one of my favorite playwrights. And I think it's in Heartbreak House uh, where he says, when the angel of death sounds his trumpet, the pretenses of civilization are blown from men's heads into the mud like hats in a gust of wind. And I think that really sums up uh, this line of inquiry. All right, let's set this aside and uh, let's move on to another area of interest to us. And, and this has to do with the effects that existential fears have uh, on political preferences. Who's ever heard of the German sociologist Max Weber? Is anybody back? And uh, my point is Weber, an excellent non-pharmacological intervention for insomnia, but also <laughs> a, a profoundly important thinker. Uh, who at the beginning of the 20th century introduced the term charismatic leader. I know you've all heard that term, but what Weber said is that in times of historical upheaval, people often become attracted to a certain kind of leader, a, a kind of superficially larger than life, uh, almost uh, heroic individual who is often believed to be divinely ordained uh, to rid the world of evil. And a lot of people have used uh, Weber's analysis of charismatic leadership uh, to understand Hitler's rise in Germany. Because remember, Hitler was elected uh, in the 1930s. And we got interested uh, in this, unfortunately, in the aftermath of the events of September 11th, 2001. Depending on your age, who remembers what you were doing that day? And who also remembers that president, the president at the time was George W. Bush. And on September 10th, 2001, President Bush had one of the lowest approval ratings in the history of presidential polling. I hope you'll remember that, those of you that were around. Three weeks later, he had one of the highest approval ratings. Who, who remembers that? Again, just a couple of head shakes. And this was true for Democrats as well as Republicans. And, and we wondered about that. Why? What happened to President Bush? Was there a magical metamorphosis from a functionally illiterate oil industry <laughs> neocon meat puppet uh, to a competent and efficient public servant? Maybe. <laughs> or silliness aside, or uh, could the events of September 11th uh, have posed an existential threat to the American public to the extent that quite unconsciously we became attracted to the president who two days after September 11th said, we will uh, rid the world of the evildoers. And in a cover story of Time Magazine in October of 2001, uh, he said that uh, he believed that God had chosen him to lead the country at this perilous time. So we did a bunch of experiments uh, in 2003 and 2004 all over the United States where we would remind some people of death and some people of something unpleasant. And, and then we asked them, uh, well, do you support President Bush and his policies in Iraq? And in every one of the studies, we found that Americans were not particularly enthusiastic about the president or his policies in Iraq, except if they were reminded of death first. And that substantially increased their enthusiasm for the president and his policies. And in one particularly striking experiment that we did five weeks before the 2004 election at Rutgers University with Americans who were registered to vote and who intended to vote, we reminded them, randomly divided them into two groups. One group thought about death, the other group thought of something unpleasant. And then we just asked them, who are you going to vote for? 
support in the election, not a public proclamation, private ballot, stuff it in the box. And what we found was astonishing. In the control condition, people said that they intended to vote for Senator John Kerry by a four to one margin. But when reminded of their mortality first, they said they intended to vote for President Bush by a three to one margin. Now, I wish we had the lights on so I could ask you if you understand uh, how profoundly disconcerting those findings are. And th these findings should concern any of us, regardless of our political predilections, uh, because they have ominous implications for democracy, which ideally uh, uh, tells us that elections should be decided uh, by rational deliberations of people that have at least a bit of information about relevant issues. And, uh, and of course, uh, uh, 2001 is done, but 2016, not done. Uh, and here we are in the wake of a presidential election with very similar historical conditions. We haven't had another 9-11, but we had the Paris attacks, we had the San Bernardino shootings, uh, we have Donald Trump saying that he will make America great again uh, by building a giant wall and keeping all the immigrants out. And, and two months ago, we did our first study uh, where we showed the same thing, that Americans reminded of their mortality, uh, reported that they supported Donald Trump more uh, and were more willing to consider voting for him. Uh, and I'll say no more about that, except vote early and often uh, in the coming election. All right, let's move to another area. And, and let's talk about how our concerns about death uh, alienate us from the nature and contribute to the degradation of the physical environment. Uh, anyone suffer through, even though it's one of the greatest documents ever, the John Locke's second treatise on government, uh, where Locke says, uh, he says, you know what? Anything, uh, anything that is in nature and that's alive it is of finite duration. And, and what Ernest Becker says is, yeah, and that's why nature really makes us uncomfortable. And that's the psychological impetus for the creation and the formation of supernature. If we were happy with the world as it is, uh, we wouldn't have to create a supernatural dimension uh, that enables us to transcend the boundaries of time and space. And because of that, uh, what we have found in our studies is that when people are reminded of their mortality, uh, they become incredibly hostile uh, to the fact that humans are animals. So when we remind people of death, they deny uh, that human beings are animals. When we remind people of death, they have more negative attitudes towards animals, and they say it's okay to kill them uh, for reasons other than food and medical research. Right, when we remind people of death, they become very uncomfortable with their own bodies, and, and they don't like things that would normally be extraordinarily pleasurable, even sexual activity. And when we remind people of death, they become very uncomfortable uh, with natural surroundings. A, a team of Dutch psychologists did a great study uh, where they showed Dutch people who had been reminded of death or not pictures of either a forest or like a neighborhood with lawns and, and bushes. And, and under control conditions, uh, people like the forest more than the neighborhoods. But when they were first reminded of their mortality, uh, they didn't like the forests. And now they like the burbs with the symmetrical bushes. All right, finally, when people are reminded of their mortality in simulated games that have to do with the management of natural resources. So in one study, people are told, well, pretend that you're the owner of a forest and you're, you have to decide how many trees you're going to chop down. But if you chop down too many trees, well, then the forest isn't going to grow back. Well, the good news is under control conditions, people will temper uh, their behavior in the service of maintaining the non-renewable natural resource, or at least not renewable in a timely fashion. However, when first reminded of their mortality, uh, they just cut the crap out of the forest, <laughs> suggesting uh, that part of our cavalier disregard for the natural environment has to do uh, with death 
denial. And of course, we can't talk about the degradation of the natural environment uh, without also thinking about uh, that human beings, particularly in Western society, uh, are overwhelmingly, one might claim, preoccupied with the insatiable desire for money and stuff. I haven't been in Boston for a while, but do we still have shopping malls here? Anybody go <laughs> shopping yet? More people shop the day after Thanksgiving giving in the United States uh, than who vote in presidential elections. Um, uh, Tennessee Williams, Tennessee is Tennessee Williams, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Anyone know that play? Do you remember Big Daddy uh, who says the human animal is a beast who dies and if he's got money, he buys and he buys and he buys. And I think the reason he buys everything that he can buy is that in the back of his mind, he has the crazy hope that one of his purchases will be life everlasting. Well, sure enough, we and other researchers have done studies. When we remind people of death and we ask them, well, how much money uh, would you like to have? People say that they want to have more money. And when we remind people of their mortality and we show them advertisements for fancy luxury items like a Lexus or a Rolex, People say, oh, I need that, I, I want that. I, in one great study done by Polish researchers, uh, they, they brought people in and they reminded them of their mortality, and then they just asked them to draw pictures of coins and, and Polish uh, paper money. And, and what they found is after people were reminded of death, they were asked to draw accurate representations but they drew bigger coins and they drew larger money, suggesting that money looms larger on our minds when existential concerns are aroused. Finally, they did one more study. They gave some people a pile of money and they said, hey, just count this money. And then they gave other people a pile of paper, same size as money. And they said, hey, just count these pieces of paper. All right, then they said, give me back the money, give me back the paper and they measured death anxiety. And people who just got to count money uh, reported having less death anxiety. I think that's a very profound indication uh, that money has a lot more to do uh, with uh, than the rational exchange of goods and services. Let's talk about one more area that I think is illuminated by considering these existential ideas. And that's the fact that America is currently a petri dish of psychopathology. Uh, who's aware of the fact that according to the National Institute of Mental Health, about 12% of the American population is currently depressed and about a third uh, of the American population will be depressed at some point in their lives. This is 10 times higher uh, than after World War II. Another third of the American population is addicted to drugs and alcohol. Uh, the final third is, as I speak, watching a Survivor to see who could drink the most yak urine, or they're in their SUV on their way to Walmart to see if they can save a dime on a chainsaw or a lemon. Uh, and, Silliness aside, uh, the point here is that whenever there's wholesale dissatisfaction, dis-ease in any culture, what Ernest Becker said, what Martin Seligman said, who was the president of the American Psychological Association in the 1990s, is that we need to step back and we need to look at the values that our children are taught to embrace and we need to consider whether or not those values are realistically attainable by the average individual. All right, who remembers the American dream? Who, like me, grew up being told that if you work hard, uh, you could be just as rich and even famous uh, as Bill Gates or Steve Jobs. Do you, do you remember that? Uh, and uh, if you, but if you, but if not, uh, well then that's your fault. So that's the so-called American dream. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that it is highly unlikely economic mobility in the United States uh, is incredibly limited. You are more likely to get out of poverty in Bangladesh than you are in the United States. 
But if you embrace the American dream and you're 40 years old in a polyester suit selling three pound burritos on the second shift at the drive through at Taco Bell, well, you're taught to blame yourself. And that's a recipe uh, for psychological despair. Uh, women have it even harder because we expect women uh, to also be fiscally successful, uh, but we also hold them accountable for standards of physical beauty that are literally unattainable. Who's aware of the fact that a picture of the pretty women in Cosmopolitan, those women are all touched up. Are you aware that they don't actually look like that? And uh, the fact is, is if I can't floss my teeth with you, you're too chunky. Uh, and, and if you're older than 25, I don't know what the current use by date is uh, of women in our society, uh, but uh, these are impossible standards. Uh, and the point very simply is I think we are paying the price psychologically now. I was the last generation of Americans where it was okay to be average. Old timers might remember uh, the, back in the day, uh, the average person was average. Uh, and that, that was all right. Uh, you didn't have to disembowel yourself in the parking lot of your college if you got a B. A B was good. Uh, and uh, we used to get drunk and tear down the goalposts on the football field and bring them into our dorm rooms. Uh, and uh, I, I, I fear for the youth today because I think, again, without belaboring this point, that they are being held accountable uh, for standards that are just not realistically attainable. And this is a recipe for psychological despair. Thomas Hardy, one of my favorite British novelists, he said, if a way to the better there be, it, it comes from taking a close look at the worst. And uh, that's pretty much what uh, we have done tonight. What I would submit uh, is that malignant manifestations of repressed death anxiety uh, bring out the worst in us. They, they make us demoralized, uh, hateful, warmongering, proto-fascists proto uh, plundering the planet in, in our insatiable quest for dollars and dross in a Facebook alcohol uh, TV stupor. Uh, and uh, I don't think it is overly polemic uh, to agree with the psychohistorian Robert J. Lifton, who said that, that we may be the first form of life uh, to be to have the ignominious distinction of being responsible for our own extinction. All right, I'm tempted to stop because it's late, but I don't want to leave you with that thought because it's, <laughs> it's like, oh, thank you very much. All right, but uh, <laughs> have a good night. Meet me uh, behind the dumpster in the grocery store and we'll guzzle some woolite. All right, uh, let's not stop there. Uh, 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 let, let's end uh, on a slightly more propitious note by, by, by noting, and I do think this is of radical importance, that human beings, we have a, a really fantastic track record historically uh, of extricating ourselves from some very serious problems once we understand uh, what underlies them. So in the Middle Ages, when half of Europe was wiped out from the plague, we weren't getting anywhere when we attributed the plague to evil spirits. Right, but then we figured out that it was bacteria. And once we did that, we invented penicillin and that led to modern medicine and probably why most of us are still alive today. Right, by the same token, uh, I would submit that if we could collectively come to recognize uh, the central role that mortal terror plays uh, in our lives, uh, then we might be able to deploy our remarkable ingenuity in the service of reducing the destructive potential uh, that our existential fears can and uh, often do unleash. And so let me leave you with two of my favorite thoughts. I don't have any thoughts of my own, but other people that I like. Uh, Albert Camus, in his notebooks, he said, come to terms with death thereafter Anything is possible. And, and I like that, maybe an overstatement, although I, I hope he's on the right track. And the reason I mention that is because if these ideas have merit, 
then uh, we're all implicated. I think it's incumbent upon each of us to just think about uh, the extent to which concerns about our mortality uh, influence a, a lot of what we do. And I think it's important to note that death anxiety is not itself the, the problem. The death's not going to go away. Death anxiety's not going to go away. Uh, what, when we get into trouble is, that, is when we repress death anxiety, when we bury it under the psychological bushes and it comes back to bear malignant fruit. And that's when I think it causes us some difficulties. One more thought from Eric Erickson. Anybody remember him, the famous psychohistorian? Uh, Erickson said, uh, when parents have the courage to die, their children will have the faith to live. And I really like that idea because what it points out for each of us is that this is not only about us. The decisions that we make or that we fail to make uh, about coming to terms with our own mortality it influence not only the course of our lives, but the lives of the people that come after us. I think there's a tremendous amount at stake uh, and that we each can contribute to, as corny as it sounds, uh, making the world, if not a better place, how about a slightly less troubled one? Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you. Oh, this is better. I, I can see you all look vaguely familiar. So do my kids when I see them, though. So I, evidently, we can have some questions, which would be great. I just want to start off with you mentioned um, in our phone conversation prior to the program about the judges. Oh, yeah, you know what, Lisa? I'm so sorry. So can I have a minute for that? Yes, yeah, please. I, uh, it's no, very the, uh, interesting. We had a pre-production meeting. And of course, they, these great folks at the museum are like, oh, uh, you know, we must, you must talk about this. And then I didn't do it. Not, uh, <laughs> not, in, not intentionally, uh, but uh, I, I do think this is important. The very first study that we did was with municipal court judges in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, we divided them in half. Half of them think about death. The other half think about not death. And then we asked them to set bond for an alleged prostitute. Uh, and we were just interested in whether or not death reminders uh, would influence the punitive reactions of the judges. And, and they sure did. In the control condition, the judges set an average bond of $50, uh, which was typical at the time when they were reminded of their mortality. The bond was nine times higher, $455. When we asked the judges, they said, no way your stupid questionnaire uh, could have influenced our judgments. Uh, my silly joke to Lisa is, you know, next time you get a parking ticket, pray that the judge hasn't driven past a cemetery on uh, the way to sentence, sentencing you. But more seriously, I've been an expert witness in several death penalty cases uh, where an argument has been made that we shouldn't show people gratuitous death-related imagery just prior to sentencing. And there's been more than one study that shows that legal decisions are routinely altered by these momentary conditions that include death reminders. Thanks for, telling, for reminding me of that, Lisa. Okay, so our, our first question is going to be right here. Okay, so everything you're saying here really kind of rings true, at least you know, to me, you know, in a lot of ways. Um, but just to play devil's advocate here, uh, which is what I do, <laughs> the uh, going back to the uh, you know, man's inhumanity to uh, men with differing ideas. Yeah. Where do people factor in who, ha who might have truly convicted beliefs that there's an afterlife and uh, they're all set and this whole death thing is just going to be like graduating from high school or a corporate re relo package or something and it's just not that big a deal and if somebody disagrees you know that's too bad i'm sorry you don't see it the right way you know you're lost not mine but yet we've had historically all this animosity towards different people what's going on there is people are it was there never really truly any convicted belief in an afterlife or is there something else going on uh, you know, in addition to, you know, to the fear of death? Yeah, uh, great question. And we should talk 
uh, afterwards, ju just so we don't get bogged down, sir, because um, I don't know. We think there's other things going on, and we think that people, despite their confident uh, proclamations to the effect uh, that they're certain of what will happen or when the psychological crap hits the fan, as it were, end up not being so sure. Anyway, it's a, it's a profoundly important point that we've been struggling with empirically, and it's a good one. Uh, we have another question right here. Thank you, Professor Solomon. It's Vera. <laughs> You're amazing. Vera. You changed my life when I had you as a, as a student. Um, okay, so I guess my question is, and you probably get this a lot, um, you talked about um, religion in regard to death denial, and uh, Christians and Jews and Indians and Pakistanis and Hindus and, you know, all that. What about when someone's an atheist or a Buddhist or, you know, who doesn't have necessarily like this pre-described yeah. notion about an afterlife? Um, I'm just curious. No, very good. Vera and I go way back. When did you graduate? 2003. I can't believe yeah. it. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, good point. Um, you know, the Buddhists should be pretty good, uh, but in you know the country formerly known as Burma, they ha they don't have a real good track record in terms of their treatment of others. All right. Having said that, though, uh, we have studied Buddhist monks in Asia, I can't remember what country, and they don't re respond defensively to death reminders. So there, there's at least some possibility, and I believe this earnestly, that uh, it is possible. Um, you know, who's, who's seen the Tibetan Book of the Dead? Where, and there's lots of religious and philosophical traditions where we are taught that it takes a lot of time and effort but we can come to terms with our mortality to the extent that we shouldn't behave this way. Right, but atheists are not like that. Um, it turns out, and again, this is another one of these things, we'll catch up and we'll talk more. Uh, atheists turn out to be different than people who describe themselves as agnostics, right? We, uh, the agnostic just says, I, I don't know what I can't know. The atheist is the flip side of the religious fundamentalist, right? They each are ardently convinced of that which can't be known. And so when we remind atheists of their mortality, uh, they're just as vicious as their theistic counterparts. And they become more convinced that uh, God doesn't exist. And so our view is that atheism is just uh, another death-denying worldview, and a rather shallow and disenchanted one. Moreover, uh, when atheists are reminded of their mortality, uh, and we give them, not we, but there's some folks at Oxford that measure what's called implicit or unconscious religious beliefs, what they find is that atheists reminded of their mortality, they say they believe in God less, but unconsciously they become more religious, just like religious people. So I guess what I would say is that uh, there's a lot more work to be done, uh, but I don't buy the arguments with all due respect of the Christopher Hitchens of the world or the Richard Dawkins when they say, oh, religious people uh, are these poor deluded bastards and atheists are the all-encompassing repositories of wisdom who see the world clearly and truly, well, if that were the case, they wouldn't respond to death reminders in the same way that their theistic brethren do. Great point, though, Vera. Next question here. Um, my question is, uh, when you become so accustomed to being on the brink of death, um, does that, uh, how would that affect the denial of death? Wow, um, good question, sir. And that's what we're doing right now. Um, and without trying to sound defensive, because I think your question is, is really important. Tom and Jeff and I, we spent 30 years just trying to show in our studies that these death reminders have predictable effects. And now the real work starts uh, and what I mean by that is to get at the nuances, to address the questions, the, the fine questions over here, 
uh, we're studying people uh, who work in healthcare settings like nurses and surgeons. We're studying first responders, fire people, uh, and police who put themselves at risk all the time. And we don't know, which is just my way of saying I need to come back here someday if I can <laughs> con the folks that ask me. And I'll get back to you on that. I think that it's an important question, but like all the good ones, I, I got to go with I don't know yet. Okay, next question's right here. I wonder in uh, any of your studies, have you studied uh, people who uh, uh, trend towards suicide? It seems like it's a growing proportion, particularly amongst young people. Uh, it's one of the leading causes of death where uh, they lo no longer strive to maintain their own lives. Yeah, absolutely, sir. Um, the, the straightforward answer is we've not done that, not because we're uninterested, uh, but because we can't see a way to do that in an ethical fashion. Uh, what we would like to do, I mean, in principle, and again, this is where uh, science in theory uh, butts up against uh, w practical constraints. Uh, if people who were prone to suicide, if we gave them subliminal death primes, uh, then you would expect suicidal ideology to increase. We do have a chunk of a chapter in our book about suicide where we argue based on clinical research that most people, not everybody, but most who commit suicide uh, believe that there's something on the other side that is better than their lives at present. Uh, but uh, no, we haven't, haven't done that, again, not because we wouldn't like to, but because it would really be tough to, to do it in an ethically sane way. Next Thank question you. here. So as I know, the shamanist cultures, you know, the, the cultures we call primitive probably, they don't really hate other religions. Like they're absolutely tolerant to other religions. And that was observed like for like shamanist, maybe enemies cultures and so on. Uh, have you investigated this and looked at, or do you have any explanation for this behavior? Yeah, actually that's a, another one of these. Every one of these things are, are great. You know, and, and again, these are the high dollar questions that if I could answer, I'd be chugging rum out of a coconut on a beach with my Nobel Prize. Um, <laughs> we, uh, uh, because, uh, all of these effects that I reported uh, have been found in Asian cultures, but they're, you know, in a modern secular world, we've been kind of homogenized. And it is true uh, that, that non-monotheistic religious traditions are fairly ecumenical with regard to the toleration of people with different religions, uh, but they always see them as not as inferior to their own. So most primitive cultures, and again, we write about this in our book, I don't know if it makes us right, but what we learned reading anthropologists is that most primitive cultures, the word for their culture uh, means human to them. And of course, the implication therefore is that if you're not of their culture, uh, then you're slightly less than human. So you might be tolerated, but it doesn't mean that you're not denigrated. Good question, though. No. Okay, we have a question right here. I can't see. Uh, now I can see. So you, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying that our, our death uh, uh, anxiety is an inherent part of our humanity. Um, so potentially not learned or acquired, but have you looked at all in children to see if their perspective is different than adult? And I'm not sure where the cut point would be to define what a child is since it's yeah. a continuum of development. Yeah, okay, again, another annoyingly, uh, and I mean that as a compliment. Uh, 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 no, another, uh, look, it's an incredibly important question. We, we have a chapter in our book on uh, you know, how children become aware of death. There's a massive clinical literature uh, that suggests that kids are aware of and concerned about death long before their parents think. So the, the Sylvia Anthony in the 1940s and 50s, a British psychologist, interviewed children and their parents. And kids as young as two or three uh, express concerns about death while their parents are saying, oh, they never even think about that. You know, young people here, you know, have a pet or a plant first and don't have kids for this particular reason. But I was interested when we had kids as to 
uh, when the issue would arise and if it would be precipitated by any particular event like the death of a relative or a pet. And um, unclear if there's a predictable devel developmental progression. Now, there has been some research by Israeli psychologists suggesting that children as young as nine, when they're reminded of their mortality, uh, hate uh, Russian immigrants in Israel, and, and they love Jewish people. So what I can tell you with confidence is that by age nine, the effects that I spoke about tonight are already manifested in kids, but that doesn't really address your question as to what point uh, it happens. Does it happen at the same time for all people? or whether or not we're able to delineate a developmental trajectory that can shed light on that. So again, another great question that we need to get to. Next question over here. Hi, I'm wondering if you've seen anything about how long has to pass between the reminder of death and the effect you're seeing. So, I mean, obviously the people in the control group had been reminded of death in maybe the past week, but they still wanted to vote for John Kerry yeah. How long do you have to go? Yeah, you know, you guys are awesome. Uh, <laughs> and we should stop soon before I stop, before my, uh, I don't know, get too tedious. All right, again, another high dollar question. In our world, we call that a stochastic issue, I think is the word, which is, you know, what's the time course uh, of this? There have been studies that show that these death reminders that we do in the lab persist for hours or even days. But again, that doesn't answer your question as to, you know, that's the, the beauty of the lab experiments is that by, by creating a completely artificial environment for a very short amount of time, uh, we can really surgically alter conditions. So one group of people is exposed to one thing and another group uh, not. But as you really rightfully point out and accurately, uh, we're assaulted by a bullion base of death-related imagery on a relatively regular basis. And that raises another important empirical question as to how much that affects us. And good point. Right, somebody asked me a yes or no question. Okay. Which really <laughs> Do you have a yes or no? <laughs> All right, here we go, over <laughs> no, here. No, I'm being silly, but these are great questions, by the way. I can phrase this as a yes or no question, but have you done any research or are you aware of any research on um, how attitudes about abortion have been impacted by um, death anxiety? No, we're doing that now. So, uh, and I, that's, a, that's a great one. So right now we're looking at attitudes about really um, current social issues. So what I can tell you is that Americans reminded of their mortality hate Muslims and object to a mosque being built in their neighborhood. Americans reminded of their mortality hate immigrants and object to immigrants uh, moving into their neighborhood. The two things we're looking at now uh, are um, attitudes about guns and attitudes about abortion, given that these are of such prominent and controversial concern. So, uh, no, we haven't done it, but we are doing it. So that's why I've got to come back, baby. Next question here. Um, I've noticed that um, a lot of times people don't seem to care about environmental issues, even since the inconvenient truth and beforehand. And even at my own church, they'll throw all the plastic tablecloths into the trash, even though they're pretty clean and you could return them to the supermarket, or they'll throw things away, or people will tell you, oh, I do it at home, I don't do it here. I do it at home, I don't do it on vacation. They have a million excuses about why they are not going to help the environment, and they don't seem to want to face it, and they don't want to take the blame for, gee, we might have done something to the planet, maybe that's why we're having all these uh, wild weather and climactic problems. Um, so do you think this might be sort of like the forest and the suburbs type thing? I, I do, but I, I, without um, running the risk of appearing to be monolithically simple-minded. In other words, what I would argue is that death anxiety is implicated in all of these issues, but it doesn't follow from that that it's the only factor. D does that make sense? 
Uh, for example, there's some great research, and it has nothing to do uh, with, with what I talked about this evening, um, that shows that a lot of people uh, who are resistant uh, to the idea of global warming, so who's aware of the fact that if, you know, as a, a, a caricature of a stereotype, people that describe themselves as conservative tend to be climate deniers. Do, you, do, you, do we know that in Boston? All right, well, but uh, there's a great study by some guys at, at Duke uh, where they show that conservatives are, are, are more willing to admit that global warming is real uh, if you show them evidence that it can be solved uh, solely through market forces. All right, but uh, if you argue that it is an intractable, an intractable problem, is it Naomi Wolf or Naomi Klein who writes about uh, how uh, one of the problems with the climate is that it's too big an issue, the market can't fix it, well, it's then that they become most ardently opposed to the proposition that the environment is changing. All right, I say that just to point out that uh, the world is complex and almost certainly all of the phenomena that I spoke about tonight that where I claim that death anxiety is a factor, I don't mean to imply that it's the only factor, but I think it's part of it. Good point. Okay, over here we have another question. Hi. Hi there. Hi. Yes or no? <laughs> Thanks, Hank. <laughs> I'll go with do, no. Do, do, <laughs> do, do parents uh, tend to exhibit less fear anxiety than do non-parents? Oh, good question. I, I don't know. I, what, what I can tell you, just based on our studies, uh, is that um, when parents are reminded of their mortality and you ask them how many kids they intend to have, they say they want to have more kids, they say they want to have them sooner, and they say they're more likely to name them after themselves. <laughs> and that freaks me out because there's enough Sheldons in the world without <laughs> another one, so please don't bring up the death thing. <laughs> Your question over here. Hi. Hi. Um, this is going to sound kind of weird, but have you ever done anything or know of anyone that actually did a study with people who have suffered, well, lack of a better term, a near-death experience, meaning they were literally on death's door and either, you know, near-fatal illness, accident, something along that line? See, um... We're doing that right now. This is a great question. You may, finally, I can say yes. Uh, I, there's a very talented uh, PhD student. Uh, his name's Simone Bianco. He's from, he's from the University of Padua in Italy. And he's with me at Skidmore College this spring doing his doctoral dissertation research. And we are studying people who have had near-death experiences and it's already known that people who have had near-death experiences report lower death anxiety. But that's, uh, but that's if you ask them if they're afraid of death. The problem is, is that in our studies, the people who say that they're the least afraid of death, when we remind them of death, they become the most hateful of people who are different. Right? And so, therefore, uh, it's just like a self-esteem scale. So when you ask people for, to report their self-esteem, people who say they have high self-esteem, they often do, or they're pathological narcissists who actually have low self-esteem. So what Simone and I are doing uh, is we are studying people who have had near-death experiences and we're measuring uh, unconscious death anxiety in ways that we can talk about. By the way, um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll have some more questions, but um, uh, I'm Sheldon Solomon. I work at Skidmore College. You know how to use the internet. These are, these are like uh, great questions. No, I encourage everybody who's interested, if you want to see like the published studies of anything that I talked about this evening, uh, please write to me. If you have 
questions, even to ask me the ones you did tonight and want me to actually think about it for a while and maybe say something besides, I don't know. Um, uh, let's keep in touch. And I, I mean that sincerely and quite uh, with a good deal of self-interest because most of our research over the decades is a result of these kinds of what I find exhilarating exchanges where somebody says, what about this? What about that? And that's how we get our ideas. And so near-death experiences, we're looking at that now. I'll, I will get back to you. Very good. Okay, another question right here. So you give a number of very compelling examples of death reminders um, uh, el eliciting bad behavior. Yeah. Kind of culminating in some uh, current um, events regarding uh, politics. Yeah. Um, is there a psychological immunization? Can the reverse messages... Um, uh, or, or, or can you conceive of messages that might blunt that or even trigger the opposite response? Yeah, excellent. And that's, um, this is going to sound awfully familiar. That's, that's what we're now doing. Um, um, no, our, we, um, uh, you know, coming from the, you know, back in the day, uh, we were really interested, as was Becker, in trying to kind of uh, delineate the psychological underpinnings of uh, the most unsavory characteristics of human behavior. And now I'm kind of sick of death and I'm more interested uh, in life. And this is what we would now like to do to, to be more precise and to respond to your fine point. Uh, yeah, now we want to see if we can leverage some of these same psychological phenomenon uh, to bring out the best in us. Because what I talked about this evening was decidedly and surely once. Uh, and this is now what we're trying to figure out because uh, I would like to think that uh, like any phenomenon, the, uh, there's two sides to, to every story as it were. Good point, sir. Um, we have one more question right over here. What impact do you think studying death and therefore being reminded of your own mortality on a constant basis has had on you and your colleagues? Uh, uh, <laughs> look at me. Uh, <laughs> all right, good, good point. That, that, uh, that's actually a nice way to, to have a last question. Um, I must confess, where's Lisa? I'm also not a big fan of death. So when Lisa said that you didn't, when you realized it when you were five, my epiphany is when I was eight years old and my grandmother died. And, and the night before, my mom said, say goodbye to grandma. She's not going to be here. I'm like, what's up? And she's like, oh, grandma's dying. And then like, okay, fine. And I'm sitting around the next day. And I'm like, oh, wow, Grandma, yeah, that's a downer. I'm going to miss you. And then I'm like, oh, but that means my mom's going to grow old, and who's going to make me chocolate pudding? That's really bad. <laughs> and I was looking at my stamp collection, and I saw I had all these old stamps, American stamps of the dead presidents, George Washington, you know, Adams, Monroe. And I'm like, God, these guys are all gone. And then literally, like a psychological thunderbolt, I'm like, oh, wow. Me, uh, and I have that same shudder, uh, and I, I must confess that my interest in these matters is deeply personal. And when I first read Ernest Becker, I was like, wow, this, this is actually what I've been dwelling on for all of my kidhood. Now, in some ways, when Jeff and I talk about our work, uh, we just say, well, uh, our terror management theory has been our own form of death denial, uh, that by intellectualizing the problem and doing all of these studies and writing our scientific papers and books, uh, ironically, that's actually distracted me from the raw emotion that would occur if I sat still long enough to look in the mirror and notice that I look like the guy on Jethro Tull's Aqualung, uh, <laughs> kind of teetering on the threshold uh, of oblivion. So in some ways, I, I'm not, I, I don't think that it's done much, and yet uh, I would like to think that even though it's taken decades, that uh, I've done my best to try and remind myself every day 
uh, to think about, e even in a fleeting fashion, if what I'm doing, if I'm doing it for the right reasons. And right in the sense of uh, for its own intrinsic purpose, as opposed to a manifestation of death anxiety. You know, so did we write this book uh, because we wanted to convey what we've been doing for years to other interested people? Or did we write this book because I want to be on Oprah or, or both? And I, and I don't know. And I think that's a fine question. I, I, I don't think it's made us better humans, but maybe, uh, and if Tom and Jeff were here, I think what they would say is on a good day, um, it, it's just made us a little bit more tolerant of even people who are intolerant. It's easier sometimes when we see people doing things to say, wow, that's terrible, uh, but it really may be a secondary manifestation of death anxiety, and while not thereby defensible, at least understandable. All right, thank you again so much. This was lovely. Well, amazing. Um, Dis-ease. I mean, just to really think about that word, dis-ease, and it's kind of um, poignant that so much mental dis-ease and mental illness is happening now that we're surrounded constantly by death reminders. Um, well, and if, if we can't get over it, we'll all meet behind the dumpster and drink some Woolite. <laughs> and in the meantime, um, we invite you to stay around for a book signing. Um, the museum store will be selling copies of Shel Sheldon's book, The Worm at the Core, The Role of Death in Life. And so we thank you for coming. Um, our next program is in a month, and we will be... Um, <laughs> <laughs> screening the film Endless Abilities, which is very in inspiring because it's people with physical disabilities doing amazing sports. Um, and so we invite you to come and join us for a very life-affirming program. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Come back. <laughs>